pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Amen. There in Psalm chapter 88, I want you to look at verse number 4. It says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the graves, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. The title of my sermon tonight is Free Among the Dead. This is a very distressing psalm that we're reading here. Somebody talking about being surrounded by people that are essentially dead and in America today, I believe that we are surrounded by the dead. Yeah. And I believe that we are spiritually free and we're surrounded by a bunch of spiritually dead people. Yeah. And America is getting worse and worse. And, you know, it's time for the saints to stand up. It's like, it's like there's a bunch of saints out there in the wasteland and they don't, they don't have a rock. They don't have encouragement. And I thank God for the church that he's given us here. Amen. I thank God for the freedom that we have to meet together. And it could be said, well, there's other countries that are better, or there's other countries that are worse. It doesn't really matter. The situation we have today is, number one, we're spiritually free. Number two, we are we're, we're really politically free enough to come together, read the Bible, right? As much topic as there is about, oh, that's hate speech, or you can't say this or say that. We still have the freedom today in America. And we need to do something while we still have freedom. Listen, there isn't war in the streets, right? I mean, you can move wherever you want to go. You can do whatever you, you can find whatever kind of career you want. You can have a family or not. We're free to, to make these decisions. And yet God has made us spiritually free. And I think he has certain expectations. And, and today there are many people that are not using the freedom that they have. I would say that most of us in here probably know people that are saved. They're free, but they're not in a good church. They're among the dead, right? They're surrounded by the dead. And without a good church, or maybe they're in a, a city where it's so far away, they don't know what to do. Hey, why will you seek the living among the dead, the Bible says. Why would you go to a dead city or a dead church and hope to find something of freedom, of the Spirit of the Lord where that freedom is? You know, and it, it's a strange day. I mean, people in America need to wake up. They need to get back to God. And listen, it starts in this church. And I want to encourage you today to exercise the freedom that you have. I want to encourage you also to exhort the people, the, the friends, the family, the acquaintances you have that are not in a good church, whether it be your neighbor or whether it be your brother on the other side of the country. You need to challenge them that they need to get in a good church. You need to tell them that, hey, you're free. You're surrounded by the spiritually dead. And unless you want to turn like one of them, unless you, you know what I mean? I mean, he's talking about being his acquaintances or like a bunch of dead people. It's worthless. You know, it's a waste of his time. And that's kind of how, how we are in America today. But we, we can change this. You know, becoming a disciple is a commandment of God. Yeah. Once you're saved, you should become a disciple. And, you know, as disciples that we are here in a good church, we also need to help other people see the need to move to a good church. Yeah. We need to take that responsibility upon ourselves. We got a guy saved today. And after preaching the gospel to him, everything that he had believed, his church right up here across the street, they're dead. They're yeah. spiritually dead, and he knows it. That's he right. knows he was on his way to hell, and now he's saved, and he knows it. He gets it. The light bulb came on, and, and so what I, I provoked him. I said, hey, you know, the people in your church, they don't believe this, do they? Well, no. Nope. They're dead. They're on their way to hell, aren't they? Yes, they are. He understands it. He has family members that are on their way to hell. He has friends that are on their way to hell, and, you know, now that he's saved, Lord, I hope that he gets it and he becomes a disciple and he tries to pull other people out of the fire. And listen, as Christians, sometimes we forget the importance of discipleship, but we're free in America enough today that we can become a disciple. We're free spiritually enough. God's given us the wisdom and the power to help others become disciples, to wake them up, to point them in the right direction, to teach them doctrine. This is a responsibility I believe that we all have. We need to teach, hey, teach your parents what the Bible says. Teach your friend what the Bible says. Teach your children what the Bible says. Use this freedom while we have it. Because there's no telling when it might stop. There's no telling when, oh, well, you guys preach Romans 1? Well, you're not, allowed, you're not allowed to have a church anymore. Right? Oh, well, Florida might shut you. Hey, we'll go to Georgia. Right? We're going to go where we can be free. <laughs> Brother Jake loves that idea. That's right. <laughs> And listen, that ought to be our attitude. Seriously, if they said, hey, Duval County, as of tomorrow, no churches like yours, I'm saying, okay, how far is the county line? That's right. 
All right? How far is the county line? We can still come in and get some soil when it's done. And when Florida says we're done with you, yeah, we're going to Georgia. We'll go to Alabama. I don't care. Hey, we'll go sit on a boat like the offshore casinos, you know, and we'll get people to come out to us. We'll go get them. Whatever we got to do, we're going to use the freedom we have to get people saved and to turn them into disciples. Discipleship has been neglected in America. This is why the old IFB has died. They're more worried about criticizing each other than, than growing themselves, than encouraging their brother. And you know, you know, there are people I know, I get phone calls all the time. Well, I'm in this church. It's an old IFB church. The pastor doesn't really go soul winning. I try to go. It's more invitation. You know, I'm not sure what to do. Hey, get out of the dead church. Yeah. It may say Baptist on it, but they're dead, as spiritually dead as you can get. They don't want to grow. All they want to do is maintain a building. They're not worried about preaching the gospel to souls. They're not, oh, well, you know, they preach repenting your sins and they, they question the King James. And, you know, what, what, what in the world? That's not a church. That's not of God. Well, I go to a church, they're King James only. It's, it's faith alone, but they're funding the synagogue of Satan. They want to tell me I have to support this synagogue of Satan, the Antichrist kingdom that they're trying to build over there. They're trying to help. They're lumping up with the Pentecostals to try to build an Antichrist temple over there. What do I do? Hey, get out of that dead church. Get out of that dead town. Get out of that dead city. Get out of that dead state and go somewhere else. There's plenty of places to go these days. Will you go? What's it matter? Do you have a priority for it? Listen, if your family is your priority, if taking heed unto yourself, if you're a single person, man, you got more freedom than the rest of us, right? If you're a single person in another state with no real church, what do you have to lose? We all know people like this that are in other states. Well, I mean, I know the truth, but, but what? You're wasting your time. You're spending your, and look, we're only on this earth for so many days. Where are your priorities? What matters to you? Are you willing to stand up? Hey, be part of the new IFB. We are alive. We have a living spirit. We're not a dead spirit. And you know, I, I believe that there, the God will continue to save families from this spiritual destruction. There are families in this church that said, I'm done with the dead IFP. I'm, I'm done with the dead city, the dead churches. I'm moving to a real church. I'm getting training so I can go back and save somebody else. I'm getting training so my children will go, grow up as disciples. And listen, that's the mentality we need to have today. We're free. What are you doing with it? Making yourself comfortable? Well, I got my comfort zone. Well, you just don't know my situation. Yeah, I bet it's just like everybody else. The devil's going to hang just enough of a carrot in front of your nose to keep you from getting closer to God's work. And listen, as Christians that are here, you're in a great church. We've got a lot of great families here. We've got some great soul winners here. We've got a lot happening. But don't get lazy. Don't get lazy with the freedom you have. Don't forget why you're here. Don't stop trying to be a disciple. And listen, you know, it's, it's one thing to tell your friend in the other state they need to get involved, but how about encouraging your spouse? How about provoking and teaching your children? Let's not forget what matters the most. Look, I want you to turn to John chapter 12. Do you want to be used mightily of God? Yes. How bad do you want it? Do you really want to be able to look back in 10 years and say, you know what? I, I, I stopped being selfish and I started serving God. You know what? I know I wanted this and it's not very convenient and easy to do the other, but I said I'm going to do what God wants. I'm going to go out of my way to be the best Christian I can, to be the best disciple I can. I'm going to study His Word. I'm going to teach it to other people. I'm going to have a good attitude about it when it's difficult so that God will bless me. Your time on this earth is very short. This body will die. You will die one day. You will stand before God. And I guarantee probably every one of us will have some form of regret. Oh, yeah. Well, Lord, I sure do wish I'd have done more there then. Yeah. Well, Lord, I'm so sorry I didn't use this chunk of my life for you. Right? Hey, thank God you're here. But don't forget. Don't just become lazy. Don't get laid back. You need to get on fire for God. You need to stay on fire for God. You need to get serious about being a disciple. Right. Well, but you don't understand my situation. Life is just tough for me right now. Life is frustrating. Hey, it could be a lot worse. We could live in a country where there is war in the street. And the freedom you have is, well, maybe I can sneak out today and maybe I can get food for my family. That's not freedom. Man, I'm telling you, we're so blessed and we don't get it. Oh, but, but the world's, I know what's going on. I know how bad it is. I know how bad it is compared to 30 years ago. But that doesn't give us an excuse to just stop doing what's most important. To just stop, well, you know, I don't have time for discipleship. 
If you don't make time for discipleship, you will not be used mightily of God. You need to make sure that your spirit is growing and you need to disciple other people. This is very important. In Psalm there where we're at, where he's talking about the dead eye of beads, says, Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. What's it like to be in a church where you just like grieve to go in? Man, I know they got the right Bible and they got the right gospel, but something's not right. These people aren't happy. You know, nobody smiles. It's like they're sucking on lemons. They're all frowning and... No, we're fundamental, oh, you know. Nobody wants to be like that, right? And that's, that's kind of what you see in this psalm. You know, you're, you're in a pit. It's darkness. It's deeps. Thou hast put away mine acquaintances far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. It's like, you know, I spoke up about Israel and now everybody treats me like an abomination. You know, if you've been in one of these churches and you've been an outcast and you've been isolated because you see the scriptures more clearly than you used to and somebody else refuses to receive it, it's like, well, you're an outcast, you're an abomination. It's very depressing to be in a church where you, you almost can't quite speak up. You know, Pastor Romero was telling me a story about this guy that had called him and he said, you know, he had been faithful to the, a church, they'd been going and the guy was, he, he loves Pastor Anderson. He's awake about the pre-trib and Zionism. But he just doesn't say much about it because he knows that if he talks about it in his church, he's going to be outed. And that's it. They're done. They'll kick you out because of, your, of what you believe about the end times. But they won't kick you out for not being saved. Right? The church is mixed up, but it's the best he can find. And he's talking to another individual. And it, it's sort of like they're tiptoeing around. So uh, do you watch stuff? At, at, on the internet, you know, you have any internet preachers? And turns out they're both, they both listen to Pastor Anderson. They've been in the same church for years. They both want to be soul winners. And it turns out one guy would go to soul winning for a week or two and nobody else would show up. It's just the pastor. He doesn't know what he's doing. So we'd quit going. The other guy would try to go, try to get a soul winning program. And then he would kind of lay off. And it's like back and forth. So then finally they figured it out and they got, whoa, hey, the Lord's brought us together here for a reason. If they don't do it, forget them. We're going to do it ourselves. We're going to go out soul winning. That's what God's commanded. And I mean, God's really blessing that, that strange church, that dead church, because of the living that are among the dead. Right? And you think about that today. I mean, wouldn't it just be miserable to be in such a church? Don't you thank God for the freedom that we have? We can come together and talk about all manner of doctrine. We can work together. We can praise the Lord together. We can raise children together. The ladies can have coffee hour, tea hour, hanging out. with. I mean, that's what families need is this spiritual support. Now look, you're there in, in John chapter 12. I want you to find verse number 17. Verse number 17. The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him up from the dead bear record. He does an amazing miracle. People start talking, right? He says, for this cause, the people also met him for that they heard that they had done this miracle. Now you have the people seeking. They come looking. Hey, I hear there's something amazing going on in Jacksonville. I want to be part of it. Hey, I hear that God is doing a mighty work in Phoenix, in Fort Worth. I want to be part of it. Right? Look, look what he says. Verse 19. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how we prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. Right? That your dispensationalists got together and they said, Oh, no, what are we going to do? They figured out the pre-trib is a lie. I, we sent San Gip in there, and they still know it's a lie. What are we going to do? We don't have any other heroes. Rockman's dead. Who's going to fight for us? Right? The whole world's going after them. They're figuring it out. Right? <laughs> oh, no, the IFB sheep stealers are winning. What are we going to do? Right? That's what the Pharisees are saying. Look at verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Wait a minute. Greeks? Greeks? You hear what's going on here? Look at the next verse. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now you have the Greeks seeking. They've heard of the miracles. They see something's going on. People are coming from other cities, other counties, other states, other countries to find out what's going on to take part in what Jesus is doing. Look at the next verse, 22. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Philip and Andrew tell Jesus, and Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. This was a pinnacle in Jesus' ministry. It hit a, 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 a critical mass, if you will. It hit the point of, okay, it's growing so fast now that the foreigners are coming to Jerusalem to find God. 
to find salvation. This is a big deal, right? And people were on fire. They heard something's going on. What they do? They wanted to do something about it. They made their priorities such. They didn't worry about Greece. They worried about salvation. They worried about discipleship. They wanted to take part in the ministry. Turn to Romans chapter 6. The out-of-towners were coming to be disciples now. You know, this, this new IFB movement is hitting critical mass. There are many people that are seeking discipleship. They're seeking training. They're seeking a place for their families where they can fellowship together, where kids can grow up soul winning with dad. They're seeking spiritual growth. Listen, God's doing something awesome across the country. And, you know, it's, it's our job to do something about it. Listen, there is a problem in America today. The problem is we are the living among the dead, right? We are free among the dead, the Bible says. When I walk outside of these doors, right now I'm free among the free. I go walking down the street. I go out into these apartments over here. I'm free among the dead. But you know what? I'm going to take some with me. I'm going to bring some to heaven with me. I'm going to wake them up. I'm going to free them as well. I'm going to help them be quickened in the spirit, become alive. What about the churches? There are people in this city that came and visited our church when Pastor Anderson was a guest preacher, when we were over in the other building. There are people that live 10 minutes away that visited our church. Man, I love Pastor Anderson. I want to learn to be a soul winner. I'm just trying to grow. Well, what church do you go to? Oh, Trendy Hillbilly Church down the road. What are you learning there? Nothing. What Bible do they use? Any of them? Is the pastor saved? I don't think so. Why are you there? Yeah. Right? You're the living among the dead. Yeah. What are your priorities? I mean, what do you hope to find? You come here, you're not going to find the living. It'd be rare to find somebody else that's actually saved in that kind of church. It's just trendy Christianity. It's easy come, easy go. I don't have to do any work. Well, where are your priorities? Do you really want to be a disciple? Are you really willing to sacrifice and get on fire for God? There is a problem, and it's outside of those doors. There is a problem, and it's all across America. It's a spiritual wasteland, and there are many cities that it could not be said that there is a, an honest, fundamental Baptist church that has soul winners, that are King James only, that doesn't teach repent of your sins garbage, it teaches faith alone. And there are cities where people are alive spiritually, they're surrounded by the dead, and they're, well, I don't know what I'm going to do about my kids, I don't know where to take, i got to take them to church. Well, I don't know, should I go to the Nazarene or the Methodist? Hey, how about moving and going to a real church? You've got so many options today. Look, you're in Romans chapter 6. Look at verse number 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you're yielding yourself to a dead church or to a churchless town, you're a servant to that town. You're a servant to a dead church. There is no fruit there. You will not be able to be, you have to go, you have to be sent to go so, I mean, sure you might have that one guy that that one time he spoke up and he got somebody saved that was already looking, but really the biblical pattern is that there's a place that sends you out. We, I've been sent here. I've been given a charge. I give you a charge. Go ye therefore into the world. Preach the gospel. Save souls. Set people free. Get them baptized. Teach them to become disciples. Right? This is our charge. This is our commandment. And when a church or a city doesn't have this commandment and there's somebody that's saved in that city, man, that is spiritually draining. There's no fruit to be had in such a situation. And, you know, it's time for people to just, just to go and get the training. Just to quit what they're doing and focus on discipleship. This should be your number one priority as a Christian. Discipleship. Listen, godliness is profitable unto all things. Well, I'm a mom. I don't have time for discipleship. I don't have time to learn the Bible on my own or study it. For my, my husband knows everything. I don't have to worry about it. Well, mom, how do you answer the child? Oh, how do you be profitable to the children? Spiritually speaking, you study for yourself. Right? And you train your children to read the Bible because they see you reading the Bible. Right? Discipleship is very, very important. Look at verse number 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Right? You should, if you're here, you're no longer a servant to dead IFB churches. Right? 
You're in an alive church, but don't forget that there was an old way that wasn't working. Don't get comfortable and say, well, it's just church. It's not that big of a deal. Hey, it is a big deal. Make sure you're focusing on discipleship. Otherwise, you're a servant to whatever you give your time to. What is it? YouTube? Facebook? I think Pinterest? What are you a servant to? Look at verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Are you serving the Lord in righteousness? Look at 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. He's saying, I'm saying these things as a man because your flesh is weak. Your flesh has a problem. You'd rather give in to your flesh than to do what's right. I'm trying to warn you that you're a servant to the desires of your flesh when you give in to those desires. And for some Christians in some cities, it's laziness. Hey, for some Christians in this city, it's laziness. They'd rather be in a dead church than to actually get on fire for God. Yeah. In their heart of hearts, and their spirit, they want to be a soul winner. And what are they doing about it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Listen. Don't stay in Sodom. Run. Yeah. Flee. Get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Change your life, right? If not, you will fall back into sin. And the next thing you know, you'll be a servant to sin all over again. Don't, you know, and I see buddies hanging out. Oh, yeah, we all got Pastor Anderson. We listen to Pastor Anderson. Good. You go to a good church now. Well, what are you doing? Right? I mean, you're, you're going to fail as a group. I don't care if you're there to encourage each other. You've got to have a church. You have to have somebody to teach you, to send you out. And you'll never be used mightily of God if you don't take the steps to make sure you're being separate and make sure you're being a disciple. Look at verse number 21. What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The fruit you should have in your life now is that you're growing as a Christian. You're getting stronger in the spirit so that you can overcome the flesh. And, and then you will have fruit unto holiness. Are you planning for spiritual fruit? Are you planning for spiritual fruit? Think about it. And I mean, do you, we all probably know people in a spiritually dead town or a spiritually dead church and they're not willing to make the move and their family will suffer. Their family's going to suffer. We're called to be soul winners, man. We're called to be soul winners. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that win his souls is wise. Amen. Are you planning for fruit? Are you planning for spiritual fruit? Or you, well, I have just enough physical fruit to keep me going, and I'm just enough church so I can say I'm in church, but I'm not soul winning. I'm not learning. I'm not growing. I know more about revelation than my pastor. I go soul winning more than my pastor. Man, what are you doing? Get out of there. It's dead. You're living among the dead. People need to move. Listen, if, 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 if there are people that are free, that are hanging out with dead, you have to leave the dead. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Yeah. Quit worrying about the dead. Move to a good city. Move to a good church. And make your family your priority. Make your spiritual growth a priority. Decide to become a disciple and don't look back. There is a problem in America, but it can be fixed. People came to be disciples of Jesus. People traveled from other nations to be a disciple of Jesus. Is that normal? Does God call people just to leave where they're at? To, well, what do you think? How many of you, of you in here would say, yeah, I think God called me to get closer to this church? Just one. Oh, okay, there you are. Okay. Are you guys awake in here or what? What's going on? <laughs> Can I get an amen or something? Amen. All right. <laughs> Look, when, when men began to be stirred up, when they heard of the miracles of Jesus, they saw the mighty things are doing, they're like, I want to know what God's doing. I want to be part of what he's doing. I want to get closer to this. And you know, we, we preach through the book of Ruth. Remember that? Yeah. And in Ruth chapter 1, Ruth had said, you know, if witherest thou goest, I will go. Where there lodgest, I will lodge, and thy people will be my people, and thy God my God. And Naomi saw, she's like, whoa, she's steadfastly minded to go. Right? She's ready to relocate to be near to God, to be in God's will, that's a good attitude. Yeah. Ruth did it. God called her out of that, and, and he mightily used her. I want you to turn to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. She used that freedom, and she was a blessing to Naomi all the time. Does God ask people to leave their comfort zone? Yeah. To leave their easy life, their cake job, 
Maybe you have a business and it's like, well, you, you, you don't understand my situation, it's special, okay? I've got this job and, and I don't even deserve this job and I make more money than I'm worth and I can't go to another city and get this job. Okay, so what's your idol? What's your most important priority in life? Hey, listen, you need to take care of your family. Don't get me wrong here, but I wanna make this clear. If you're more worried about the budget or the job than you are your spiritual growth, you're in sin. There's a problem. There's a problem in your life. If you're not providing spiritually for your children, but you're providing good organic food, you need to reevaluate. What if you said, well, you know what? If I took this other job in this other city, I could go to a real church, and hey, I might have to eat the GMO corn puffs, and I might have to eat the chicken with the hormones in it, but I'll do that so my children will be strong in the spirit. God would bless that. And people have the wrong priorities today. Listen, hey, hey, it's good to be healthy, but it's better to be spiritually healthy. And America is sick. America is a wasteland of wicked people. They're being deceived by the television, and you're surrounding yourselves with these old buddies. They don't have the same priority. Even the people in the churches, they don't want to stand around and talk about the Bible. They want to beat you out of the door so they can get to the buffet before you. Think about it. I mean, America's messed up. It's bad. Genesis 12, you know, Abraham was called out. The Lord said unto Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. He said, hey, Abraham, you're doing really well. You're getting really prosperous. And I see your heart. You want to work for me? Get out of daddy's house. Go get to work. Come over here. I've got something bigger that needs to happen. We need to put a root down. Genesis 45, it says, and God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. There are many Christians in America that need to leave and preserve the posterity of the next generation. They need to get out of wherever they're at, and they need to get closer to God and be a disciple. Does God really ask people to leave their situation to get closer to Him? What about that book called Exodus, right? I know they had things nice. They had all the food they wanted. The job wasn't really that bad. God told them to exit. God wanted them to leave. God had it for a time and a purpose, and they were comfortable. And, you know, they, they didn't even want to hear what Moses had to say, some of God's people initially, right? And many of them fell away in the wilderness. Exodus 3, 8, it says, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Don't you want that spiritual milk and honey? Hey, I know you guys do. You guys are here, right? But now that you're here, don't neglect the honey. Don't forget the discipleship. Don't forget the growth. Don't, well, we're in the land. I know there's honey nearby. I'll just settle for the bleached sugar. Right? Get the honey. Get the good stuff. God has things for you. But it, it's going to take some effort on your part. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some sacrifice. And those things don't happen without making it a priority. Yes, sir. You have to change your mentality and say, you know what? I need to grow. I need to gauge my spiritual growth. I need to quote more verses. I need to be able to answer more doctrine. I need to be better at soul winning. Yep. I need to have an answer to those that ask me. And I need to teach my family as well. Right? We need to have these goals. He says, and God told him, what the answer he gave him, and certainly I'll be with you. When he said to go, and he went this back and forth, and he said, hey, I'll be with you. And that's the promise. You know, I believe that there are families that said, hey, I'm going to go, and there's several of you guys. Well, you know what? I see the church. I want to get involved. I'm going to go. And God blessed you. He took care of business. He just paved the way for your job. God's upgrading the jobs of the men here in the church. Brother Matthew, last night, was it last night? Man, Monday night at the prayer meeting. I got to figure out my job. I need a better job. You know, I had something and I lost. Now I'm in day labor. I don't know what to do. No problem. We'll pray. We're here for a prayer meeting. We prayed for Brother Matthew. He got an answer the next day. Wow. Somebody literally said, hey, I'm going to hire you at X amount of dollars. I'm not supposed to hire you guys. Don't tell anybody. Hey, hey but I want you. You're doing a good job. Something for some reason, and I believe it's God, answered that prayer and said, okay, you want to do the right thing? Let's start taking these steps. Amen. Right? His, his, Matthew's request was that he could get on fire for God and get as a soul winner, be a disciple. And I said, okay, what about your job? Well, I need that too, right? He did what Solomon did. He said, I want that spiritual growth first. And God said, okay, I'll get you the job. I'm going to provide for you so you have the time and you can do these things you need to. And that's awesome. That's how God works. It's a matter of having the right priorities. God will help you move. He will supply all of your need. Look, you're in Joshua chapter 1. Find verse number 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, 
Go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give them even to the children of Israel. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give unto them. Do not be afraid to forsake all that you have for spiritual blessings. Listen, my personal story, my personal testimony, I, I was comfortable, but I knew I wasn't right. For years I was saying, I'm moving to Arizona, I want to learn from Pastor Anderson, I want to be sent out, I want to be a preacher, and then Pastor Romero gets sent out, I like his preaching, he's got some cool stuff. I said, like, you know, this is, a, this is a wild west, man. This is a new opportunity where he needs some help. I don't even know the guy. He wouldn't even take my phone call. I don't care, I'm still moving. I, I, I couldn't let anything get in my way. I lost two vehicles, I had an engine blow up, had all these problems getting there. Didn't matter. God provided the whole way. I got there safely. He provided everything I need. He provided a wife. He's provided a family. He's provided work all along the way. And if I had, if I had hesitated in any way, well, I don't know. I'm more comfortable back where I'm at. Hey, I, I, well, I want to stay in Florida. Hey, look, God sent me back to Florida. I left Florida, I got trained, I got on fire for God, I became a great soul winner to please the Lord and what God do. He said, good, stir you up, send you back. Florida needs you, go on back. Amen. I didn't think I was coming back to Florida, but hey, it's up to God, right? God had a plan. He needs people to be strong and have a good courage. I was willing to forsake all that I had, but I had a really convenient place I was living. I had my, my job situation worked out just right. Didn't matter, none of that matters. I look back in retrospect, what a waste of time. I was wasting my time arguing with idiots. You know what I mean? I wasn't getting anywhere. I wasn't effective as a soul winner because I wasn't being sent out. Look at, the, look at verse number 8 in this chapter. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that thou have, that is written therein. For then... Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Until you abide by what the, what the Word wants, what God has given us in His Word, the book of the law, you're not going to be prosperous or successful. God wants you to be a disciple. And I was talking with somebody else, you know, and when, when I began to make these moves, there were opportunities that arrived. Whoa, look at that. Boy, that would be, no, that's a distraction. Right? I'm going this way. All of a sudden, the devil opens up these doors to get me to go this way. Right? If I had gone that way, I wouldn't be here today. I, pro I probably wouldn't have those beautiful babies I have, the beautiful wife. I probably wouldn't be blessed as much by God. I probably wouldn't even be as spiritually on fire, the knowledge of the Bible, because God blessed me for submitting to his will. And listen, I believe that there are people all across America, they're living, they're alive, and they're among the dead. They're free, they're spiritually free, they'll never lose their salvation, and they're surrounded by a bunch of dead people. And they don't understand what to do. Hey, get away from the dead. Let the dead bury the dead. Go find some other people that are alive. Go find some people that want to be soul winners. Go find somebody, uh, friends for your wife and your children that love the Lord and want to serve according to the word. Look at verse number nine. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Whithersoever, that's anywhere. Turn to 1 Corinthians 7. Well, Brother Fanny, you just don't know my situation. I'm, I'm in my city, and my city is where God's... No, no, no. God's with you wherever you go. But if your goals and your priorities are spiritual things, God will open the doors for you. God will bless you. And listen, you're going to have turbulence. Right? You're sitting on the sideline. No, no, you're not even sitting on the sideline. You're tuning in on the internet and you're watching the battle. Oh, wow, there's a fight. Cool, right? Then you move, you get in the battle. You're no longer on the sideline. You're out knocking doors. You're bearing witness at work. You're on fire for God. Guess what? You're in the fight. You're going to get arrows shot at you, right? You might, I mean, think of a football analogy. You're sitting on the bench. Hey, now you're in the game. You might get sacked. You might get tackled. You might get hurt. But that, it's not over. Right? You get stronger through these things. You get better at the spiritual warfare. You get better at life. And God has a plan. And you know, you have to exercise yourself unto godliness. You have to exercise these spiritual gifts He's given you so you can become stronger. Yeah. Remember when we were going through uh, the book of Ezra? We learned about those that moved 
for spiritual reasons. He said, I make a decree, Ezra 7.13, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. He said, hey, there's people that want to go serve God. If they want to go of their free will, let them go. Everything was paid. They were blessed. And it's the same way. There are Christians in America that are sitting there watching, thinking, man, I wish I could go. Make it a goal. Make it a priority. Of your own free will, make it happen. Isaiah 61, he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. This is us going out soul winning. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Right? When you go soul winning and you get somebody saved, they're now free. They're surrounded by the dead. Let them know. Make sure they understand the implications. Now that you get this, you're on your way to heaven. Everybody else you know is probably still on their way to hell. Don't you want to do something about it? Don't you want to be a disciple and obey the commandments of the Lord? But, I, but Brother Fan, I've, I've got this job. No, no, I, I, I have a business. I have a business. I have to keep my business. You think God can't give you a bigger business or a better business or just as much money without a business and you don't have that partnership you had or you don't have that, those constraints that you had and now you're working for God? God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter what town you're in. God has people in that town. God has things that he can do. When you seek after the Lord, he will bless you. Look, you're in 1 Corinthians 7. Find verse number 21. We need to proclaim liberty to the captives. We need to tell people they need to get in church. Verse 21. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. Right? Now look. Are you called? Are you saved? Turns, okay, you get saved. and then Well, I'm just an employee. Don't worry about it. Care not for it, he's saying. But then he says, but if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. Well, I'm just an employee right now, and I'm over here, so I can't really go anywhere. Can you really? In America, anybody can go anywhere. You could just make a decision tomorrow and say, in one month's time, I'm moving to California, and I'm done. I'm going to Sacramento. I'm going to L.A. I'm going to go to Phoenix. I'm going to go to Fort Worth. I'm going to go to Atlanta. I'm going to go to a church. I'm going to do something for God. And I'm making the decision. I'm free to make that decision. I'm going to make it happen in one month. And, and I don't care. Anybody that says otherwise can't stop me. I'll get a job. I'll get an apartment. I'll get another. I'll get whatever I need. God will provide it. Listen, we're free enough in America. You can be made free. He says, use it rather. Well, I'm just a little old employee over here out in the sticks. There's no church. I'm hundreds of miles away from the closest thing. Do something about it. Amen. We need to tell others they need to be disciples. That's our job as a disciple, right? Go and do likewise. Jesus trained his 12. He sent them out and he said, now go do the same thing. Go get your own 12 and teach them to go get their own 12. This is the methods that God teaches. Look at verse 22. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. You guys, hey, we're here, we're free, we're amongst the free instead of the dead. You're Christ's servant. Are you working for him? Are you, are you making that, fo are you still focused on the goal that got you here? Verse 23, ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Be not ye the servants of men. What about my business? What about my job? Are you more worried about being a servant of a man than you are being the Lord's servant? Because that's not, that's not true discipleship. That's not what God wants you to do. Look, turn to John chapter 8. Listen, there is a solution. There is a solution to this problem. It's raising families in churches with other families. It's raising your family to become a soul winner, to know the Bible, and for them to have that network of support. We've got to have other people to help us do it. We've got to have that encouragement. Matthew 9, then, G then he said unto the disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. It is not wrong for me to pray that the, that the, the free, the Christians that are in America in this wasteland, that they would get out and come here. Or get out and go, go, go to Phoenix. Go to Fort Worth. 
Go help Pastor Burzens in Atlanta, but do something. It is not wrong for me. In fact, Jesus tells us to pray for laborers. I am praying that God will start closing doors on these people, right? Shut off their internet connection so they'll quit listening and get up and do something, right? Trick maybe all the explosions on the July 4th, they'll think it's the end of the world and they'll actually get scared to death and you know, decide to make something happen. I don't know, but listen, I am praying for more laborers all across the country. Yes, I want them here, but not just here. I, would, I, I get calls all the time. I get this call from this guy. I mean, oh, I got this, I got that. Hey, move! Amen. Get up off your butt and go somewhere. Right. Are you saying I have to come to your church? No, I'm saying you better go somewhere, though. Yeah. You better find somewhere where you feel God's opening the door. Well, how do I do it? We'll talk about that. God, it's easy. First is trust the Lord that He can provide, right? right. right. 2 Corinthians 3. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hey, in Jacksonville, there's liberty. Yeah. In Fort Worth, there's liberty. In Phoenix, there's liberty. Sacramento, L.A., Atlanta, there's liberty all across the country. Amen. Listen, it's growing. God's doing something, right? And it may, it may spur up the end times we keep preaching this much and we start changing the country. That's not for us to worry about, though. We need to do what the old dead churches have neglected. We need to be obedient to God. It's time to become a disciple. Listen, you're in John chapter 8. Find verse number 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You believe you get in the Word, you continue in the Word, you begin to become more and more free, spiritually speaking. You're no longer in bondage to the world, in bondage to sin. You're no longer a servant to sin. God can use you for something. God can use you to do mighty things. But it, those are steps you have to take to make yourself free with the liberty that He's provided. Look at verse 33. They answered Him, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Listen, Jesus wasn't always on the earth. He left, right? You will not always be in this body. This body of sin, there's a war in your members, right? Your spirit wants to do the right thing. Your flesh wants to do another. You will not always be a servant in that house. You will leave your body. What are you doing with your time in this body now? Are you worried about being a disciple? You're going to leave this body. The things this body wants to do separate you from being a disciple. It's active warfare to get involved in your own life, to change your priorities, and become a disciple. Galatians 5, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. You're not always on earth. <clears throat> what are you doing with your time? When he says, be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage, you need to move or just stay with the dead. Now that you're here, you need to keep moving. Otherwise, you're going to be like a backsliding heifer. You're going to start falling backwards. Getting farther away from what God wants you to do. Listen, don't be like that. Look at verse 36 in this chapter. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Jesus has given us the spiritual freedom to go out and do... I mean, literally, you can write your own ticket. What do you want to do with your life? What kind of job would you like to have? What kind of career? What kind of family? What kind of church do you want to be in? And most people are not exercising the liberty they've been given. You're here. You're awake. You're alive. You're spiritually free. Keep growing in the Spirit. But also, it's for us also to teach other disciples. Go get your own disciples in your neighborhood. Right? Call your family. Make it. Hey, you, Mom, you got to move. Bro, hey, bro, what you doing, man? You got to get here. You got to move. I know what's going on in your life, and you'll, it'll never be fixed by worldly problems. It'll never be fixed by a bigger income or a bigger house. You've got to get in God's will. In 2 Thessalonians 3, he says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as as with you. 
hey man, I'm praying that it'll have that God's word will have free course in your life and you will grow and your children will come soul winners like my children. Yeah. Think about it. These are the things we should encourage others about. So what, what are, what's the methods to getting out of that bondage? Or tell, when somebody said, well, what do I do? How did you do it? What, how, what can I do to get closer? I believe there are certain steps we can follow. Number one, it's save. Save a little bit of money, right? Start putting job applications all over the place. Listen, if you have a, even if you're here right now and you say, well, my job just ain't quite doing it. It's, it does, it's not giving me the freedom to go soul winning on, the, on Saturday like I used to. I'm not making the budget like I used to or like I need to. You know, somebody just told me recently, and it makes so much sense, you just, you just put as many irons in the fire as you can because you never know which one's going to get hot first. You put in as many job applications as you can, and the first call might be the one, it might not. You might want to take that first call and then trust God and he might provide another still yet. You keep looking, you keep moving, you don't, you don't play around, you get serious about your job. But prayer is part of this. You have to pray asking the Lord for wisdom, you have to trust that God will answer that prayer. Look, you're in Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse number 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Are you seeking after God? Or are you diligently trying to get in God's will? God can and will move your family safely. He'll provide for work and business. Look at the next verse. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. God warned him, right? He says he's moved with fear. Do you fear your children growing up in a dead church? Right? Can you call your friends and say, hey, listen, the end of the world is coming. The city you're in doesn't have any soul winners. The church you're in is teaching bad doctrine. You've got to get out of there. You need to be moved with fear, afraid of what's going to happen to your children, and get somewhere where God can use you. Look at the next verse. By faith, Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And when he went out, not knowing whether he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. He's saying he was just sojourning. He's just traveling through. It's like he's just passing through. He's living in tents. Look at 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What city is he talking about? New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. Yeah. Are you looking for New Jerusalem? You need to be, because that's where you're going. That's your ultimate destination. Hey, and this is a stop. I'm stopping here in Jacksonville for the rest of my physical life until I go spend my eternal life in New Jerusalem. That's the city I'm looking for. Turn to James chapter 1. We're almost done here. James chapter 1. The town you're in is not the final destination by any means. Not at all. Psalm 119, 45, it says, And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. You really want to be free? Seek after the Lord. You have to believe that he will reward you for seeking after him. And then don't lose that focus. Keep those goals. God wants your family to grow. God wants you to, if you don't have a family, God wants you to have a family. But if you're not getting in the will, how are you ever going to find the right family? These guys that visited, that go to this dead church down the road, single guys. Why are they still in this dead church? Well, they're looking for a wife. They're looking for a wife. Well, what kind of wife are you going to find in a dead church that preaches strange doctrine, that has a pastor that's not saved? It's a rock and roll band. What kind of wife do you want? You want a wife that you have to, oh, no, no, everything you've ever believed is a lie. Hopefully they could get her saved. But again, if, I mean, if they're not going out preaching the gospel, it's, I mean, it's constant contention right <laughs> be careful where you go looking for a wife you might just find you know what i'm saying <laughs> you don't go to a bar looking for a wife you don't go to a false church looking for a wife right, oh but that pentecostal church they, they have that that hair that go they don't they don't cut their hair and they wear those long skirts they're conservative right no they're trying to work their way to heaven all right, their, their mama and daddy is a tongue-talking devil. They've been deceived. They want nothing to do with religion because they see the hypocrisy. And you want to try to come with the truth? Good luck with that. 
Hey, you might get them saved. I'm not saying don't try, but listen, that's not where you go looking for a wife. If you're going to a liberal church looking for a wife, be careful. You might get one. You might get that liberal wife. Look at James chapter 1. Go, look at verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. There's a bunch of online listeners, online hearers. Oh, I'm just a hearer only. Cool. You tune in. What do you do for, oh, you know, I don't go soul winning. I don't have a good church. All my friends aren't saved. Get out of there. Man, wake up and run. Get close to God. Seek after Him. Yeah. Doer of the Word. A doer of... You're not saved by doing. Now that you're saved, He wants you to do. Amen. He wants you to do what it says. Look at verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the Word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way. And straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Right? What's it saying here? It's like looking into a mirror. Yep. I need to be a soul winner. i got to get in a good church. I need to raise a family for God. Well, I'll just go to work. I'll just go down to the liberal church. I mean, yep, i got to do it. Oh, well. It's sad. America is in distress. Right? We're free. And we're so free we become lazy that we as the living, as the free, have surrounded ourselves with the dead. Hey, and thank God for the church here. I just want you guys to consider your own friends, your own family, that your neighbors that you don't even know. Consider them. Make them disciples also. Make sure they're saved. Look at verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. But you don't know my situation. You don't know my job. You don't know my business. You don't know my family. It's all the same. Either God can fix it, and you believe that, and you want it, or you're just being lazy. You're being a bum. Don't put those things before spiritual growth. How do you fix it? Somebody says, what do I do? How do I get to hey, save some money? Start applying for jobs. Set a date and stick to it. Don't just say, well, one day. Hey, I, I, I said, hey, one day, one day, one day for like eight years. You know, until finally God's like, okay, go. Just go. What are you doing? Wasting my life. You know what I mean? And I thank God that I was willing to get up and go. Make a plan. Set a date. Stick to it. Look at verse number four in this chapter. James 1, 4. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. What's the principle here? Make some time, hey, make a goal, have a priority, set a date, right? And then be patient, do what you need to do, right? And then ask God, pray to God, trusting and believing that he wants to answer that prayer. You think God wants you in a dead IFB church? You think he wants you on fire as a soul winner? Come on, it's a no-brainer. Look at the next verse. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Oh no, there's this new internet doctrine. Oh no, I got tossed. Oh, there's this new thing. Oh no, hey, my pastor says I, I shouldn't go soul winning. Oh, my pastor said, hey, what's the Bible say? Don't be tossed around. Get, get under the authority of the Bible in a biblical church. Look what he says in verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Turn to Matthew 19. Who's the double-minded double man? Well, I see what the Bible says. Yep, I need to do it. Oh well. That's too much work. I'm comfortable here. I've got a pretty good job. I'm just making the bills. I got these friends that I've always had. They're not on fire like me, but they're my friends. Are those friends more important than God? Are those friends more important than your spiritual growth? Can you imagine when you get to heaven, and not only are those friends not there, but they're the reason you don't have any rewards? But I really enjoyed hanging out with them. We always did this thing. Who cares? What's it worth? What's your spiritual growth worth? What are you teaching the next generation? 
Look, Matthew 19, look at, look at verse 26. You know what? Leave, get some training, and then go back and save your friends. All right? If you're not man enough to save your friends now, if you're not man enough to speak up because you're too busy having fun, why don't you forsake your friends, search after God's will, get on fire for God, become a soul winner, and yeah, then go back and get them saved. If you can't do it on your own. Look, Matthew 19, look at verse 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, That ye which have followed me in the regeneration, he's talking about the resurrection, the regeneration of your spirit there. He says, In the re regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So first he addresses the apostles. You guys are on thrones too, in the rule and reign with Christ. We're kings and priests, right? Look at the next verse. This is to us. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. He's not saying you get everlasting life by forsaking things in the world. He's saying that's where you're going, right? You're going to everlasting life. And on the way there, if you're willing to say, you know what? I'll forsake the job. Man, if it even comes down to it, I'll forsake my family so that I can work for God. What do you think a 100-fold reward looks like in heaven? Can you imagine? Yeah, but I had this situation. Hey, 100-fold reward for what you've given up. God wants to, to bless you mightily. He wants to use you mightily. Look at verse 30. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Turn to Romans chapter 8. There are some people that may look at themselves and say, well, I'm just little old me. What can I do for God? Well, it's the end of the world. These are the last days. What can I do? It's so late. I mean, we've had all these great apostles before me, these great men of God that are mentioned in the Bible. I can never compare to them. Maybe God's done with me. You, Brother Fanny, you don't know what I've done. Brother Fanny, I, I've done some stuff. You might look at me and say, well, God can't use that kind of person. I disagree. That's exactly the kind of person that God wants. Somebody that's willing to humble themselves and say, whoa, who am I? Who am I? The person that gets up and beats their chest and say, I'm perfect for the job. I, I, I. God says, no, no, no. Right? The person that humbly begging, Lord, please just let me do something for you. Yeah. Let me get somebody saved. Let me make an impact for my city. Lord, let me be a disciple. God says, yeah, that's the attitude. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Yeah. How do you become a good disciple? You humble yourself. You make these goals. You stick to them. Listen, we got to have goals. You've right. got to have goals. I mean, if, if you should have, I mean, single guys have a goal to get married, right? Married people have a goal to have children, right? Men have a goal to do better at work or have a better job. Mamas have a goal to raise healthy children that are intelligent, that love the Lord, right? What are you doing for your own spiritual goals? Perfection, becoming per perfect as a Christian. Growth, taking heed to your own doctrine. Becoming a preacher, right? Wife support. I didn't say life support. Wife support. Get in a church where your wife has support of other wives. Amen. Other women that are doing the same things. Maybe they're doing it a different way. Maybe they dress a little bit different. Maybe they come from a different background. But they want to be daughters of the Most High God. And they're willing to sacrifice to do it. And they're willing to serve Him. That's the type of la ladies need this support. We need some wife support in some of these churches. You know what I'm saying? And the old IFB, they don't have that. Wife support is, hold my Bible, I'm going to go crank the car. We'll get to that buffet. Right? <laughs> That's not wife support. No. Listen, have some goals. Think about your own spiritual goals. Every one of you should set spiritual goals that are measurable and obtainable. Right? I'm going to get a thousand people saved this year. <clears throat> hey, start with ten. Yeah. Right? Lord, help me just get to ten and then we'll go from there. Right? Lord, I just want to read two extra chapters a day so I can learn more of you. Set some goals, do everything you can to hit them, and make sure that's something you can measure. Look, you're in Romans chapter 8. Find verse number 21. Because the creature itself 
also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Hey, we're going to be conformed to the image of His Son one day. We'll have that spiritual body, a celestial body, 1 Corinthians 15 calls it. And here He's saying, the creature, our body, we've grown. We want to be with God. We want to be closer to... We don't want the, 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 the war we have today. Look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Hey, we're looking forward to the resurrection is what it's talking about there. Man, that'll be a wonderful day. That'll be amazing. We can't even quite comprehend it. But God's saying, well, since you're looking forward to it, what are you doing to get there? Are you setting goals so that when you get there, you're like, yeah, I've been working with, for you the whole time until I got here. Or you're just kind of like, well, I'll just meander through life and I'll know I'll run into it one day. I just hope I get something when I get there. That should not be your attitude. We want to be with Jesus. We want to be with Jesus' people can we achieve these goals? Are you setting goals to achieve that, focusing on that, keeping that in focus? Look at verse number 31. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God wants you to freely have all things. He wants to have all manner of blessings. He wants you to have spiritual gifts, right? If God can be for us, who can be against us? And listen, I want you guys to consider this. I want you to set a goal. And don't forswear yourself. Do not do, don't, oh God, I promise, I'm, no, 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 no. Lord, if you would let me, would you please let me raise up one disciple? Would you please just use me to get one more person on fire for you? Would you help me duplicate myself? Man, 12, that's a big goal, right? Lord, I, hey, I want a dozen like you had, right? But can I start with one this year? God, would you help me to set the dead free, bring the dead out, and give them freedom, and show them what they can do for God, and help them get on fire? Would you set a goal to, to have a disciple? Consider it. Find somebody that wants to work for God. Just ask God, show me how to get one disciple, Lord. He wants you to have all things. He makes that clear. If God be for us, who can be against us? Yeah, but I don't know what to say. If God be for you, who can be against you? Right? The Holy Spirit will work through you, and you can get other people on fire for Him. We need to pray for God's wisdom. You know, and there are people that, that need to relocate to get in a good church. We need to help others make that decision. We need to provoke them. And listen, don't, don't be a deadbeat disciple. Don't be one of these deadbeat disciples that you just stay in Sodom and Gomorrah, and you hope for the best. America's got enough of that. Hey, I thank God for Jacksonville. I thank God for what's happening here. I'm encouraged by the spiritual growth that we're all having. The men in the church that are talking about things they didn't know six months ago. They're strong in the word, the power of his might. I mean, this is true growth. And you know what? There's many other people that wish they had this. Right? We need to pray for more laborers. Revelation 22, he says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let them that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. If it's your will, you have the free will to move, do it. If you're not close enough, if you're not on fire enough, man, it's up to you. Get on fire. This is your choice. Remember, we are the free among the dead, is what it said in Psalm 88. We are totally free, and we're surrounded with the dead. Get on fire for God. Become a better disciple. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the freedom that we have in this country. Lord, thank you for the blessings you've given us here in Jacksonville, Florida. Lord, I pray that you would send more laborers to this church. Lord, I pray that you would help us all to make a goal to have a disciple, to find someone that wants to know more of you, that wants to serve you. And Lord, we trust you to enable us to have this ministry to teach others also. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. And Lord, I just pray that you would...